Okay, let's clear out, guys. Quietly, please, the picture. Pass out the torches, please. Light them up. Everybody ready? Let's get it, boys. Get it, boys. When I read the script, I thought it was the most incredible script I read in all of my life. Three, two, one, action! Who has the balls and the guts and the knowledge to tell it like it really is? Yeah! Is Quentin Tarantino. When I read the script, I just remember my heart and mind being pulled in, in lots of different directions, but feeling like I had never seen anything like this before. How'd you like to partner up for the winter? What you mean, partner up? You work with me through the winter? When the snow melts, I'll take you to Greenville myself, and we'll find where they sent your wife. At its core, it really is a love story about a man going into Dante's Inferno, into the depths of hell to retrieve the woman he loves. To me, the love story in the film was the most important thing. Because, of course, the danger and, and the guns and all of that, I said, man, but when you look at Gladiator or Braveheart or movies like that, it was about his woman. Calvin Candy. That's the repellent gentleman who owns her. Not while I got freedom. Not while I got my gun. I told Quentin, I said, what I love about the script is that I'm not going to be able to save slavery. I ain't going to be able to cure it. I'm not going to be able to make a person think one way or the other. But what I can do is I can make sure that my woman knows that she's safe. It always makes me happy when people realize that at its core, this is a love story. Take us home. In a time when so much of the world was committed to the idea that people of African descent were not human, they were property, that you could have this love story take place between these two human beings is just so powerful. I need a honey black chocolate for a honey pad, me and a honey black grape so I can lay their ass I need a honey black preachers with a black sermon to tell from a honey black... One of the things I love about the movie is that Django is a real man at every point in his life. Whether he can read or not, whether he's the fastest gun in the West or not, he's a real man. And that is what gives him the capacity to learn and grow and evolve so he becomes the complete badass he is by the end of the film. He's gonna set the South right. And it's a pretty powerful thing to see him go from this slave to this man who's very aware of his power and his ability. This man that has been enslaved his entire life is freeing himself. And we've never seen anything like that cinematically ever. It's always been a much different dynamic. What makes this film really resonant is its backdrop. This extraordinary portrait of cruelty and slavery in this deeply disturbing part of our country's history is at the heart of it personalized by this amazing story of true love and Django going through the rings of hell to rescue the love of his life to build a better life for the two of them that they know that they deserve. And that's what makes the movie transcend. What's your name, boy? His name is Django Freeman. Hmm. I've heard tell about you. I heard you've been telling everybody that Mandingos ain't no damn good, ain't nothing nobody is selling is worth buying. I'm curious. What makes you such a Mandingo expert? I'm curious what makes you so curious. When I saw what Jamie was doing, you know, it's, it's a, a wonderful characterization. He's done a wonderful job of bringing a strong, sort of silent character that speaks when he needs to speak and acts when he needs to act. He's perfect in this role. He really is so perfect. He's the perfect, courageous cowboy out for, out for love. When I got the part, he called me, and I said to him, this is a great plan. I think we should do, you know, once a decade, we should get together and make some incredibly important, interesting, profound film, and hopefully win you an Oscar. And <laughs> What was interesting was that, how do you play the slave? A person who can't read. How do you do that when you're riding up in your Range Rover and you got your Louis Vuitton uh, backpack on and you walking in and you got your Creed on and you super fly black man, you know what I'm saying? And so now how do you go all the way back and allow the ghosts of slaves and ancestors to speak to you? What's your name? Uh, 
Jane, go. And Quentin challenged me on that. First time we went in the rehearsal, I was like, no, I want to say it like this. And I want to say it. And I was really putting me in the character. And he pulled me to the side. He says, this is what I was worried about. And grabbing someone like you, can you actually play a slave? And it hit me like, wow, he's questioning me. Like, you know. And that made me work harder. So I made sure that every time I stepped in there, I gave up to it. I have to say, I was pretty taken with Jamie. He really got what I was trying to do. He understood the story I was trying to tell. Also, we're, we're fairly close in age. He's a little younger than me, but we're fairly close in age. You know, we have uh, similar experiences growing up. I'm from Tennessee, he's from Texas. So that means he's from Texas in the 70s. <laughs> Back when they thought it was the New South, but it really wasn't. <laughs> it was just better than it was in the 50s. He hasn't walked where Django's walked, but he can understand it. He gets it. He knew what this movie could be. He knew what this movie could mean to his children. You know, the next generation of black kids growing up are going to grow up in a world where Django Unchained already exists. It could even be a rite of passage as far as watching it is concerned. And he's a great cowboy. Marrying the classic spaghetti western and the sort of George Roy Hill, Buddy, Butch, and Sundance part of the film is really fascinating because Dr. Schultz and Django, they're two very different characters. Jamie and Kristoff, as different as they are as personalities, have a lot in common. They're incredible actors. They have incredible senses of humor. Whoa. And they both are unlike the candidates to be cowboys. And out of that odd couple relationship, came the perfect team. I'm looking for the Brittle Brothers. However, I had this endeavor, I'm, I'm at a slight disadvantage. In so far as I don't know what they look like. But you do, don't you? Christoph's a fascinating actor. Definitely a man of many faces. And it's an intricate portrayal. It's you know, kind of fascinating to watch. Bonsoir. From Noir. We're here to see Mr. Calvin Candy. He's a master of all dialogue in German and French and in English. He's quite a character. He's a masterful guy. I went up to Quentin's house and he sat me at his table, put the script in front of me, and then watched me read it. And action. It was like a wonderful ritual. I'm sorry about putting a bullet in your beast. I was very touched that he would actually let me participate in his train of thought. Where's Alice? He's the one hot telling it across that field right now. Me as a fan of Kristoff, like watching the Glorious Bastards, I just couldn't get enough of this dude. And I was, and you know, I, you know me, I put everything on 10. I'm like, oh snap, what you did to me? You know, I'm that dude. I'm all up, I'm all up here. He's like, I'm like, you oh, know, and look at this. And even when he put his clothes on, I was like, oh shit. Cause I was an old shit dude, you know, that's me. Every time somebody, every time he walked out of this club, oh shit. Stop antagonizing Candy. You're going to blow this whole charade or more than likely get us both killed. And I for one don't intend to die in Chickasaw County, Mississippi, USA. Explain to Christoph about the plantation. See, he's like, I, 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 that, I just cannot believe that, that, that this happened which was absolutely great for his character because here's a guy who's navigating through a world that's totally Greek to him. This dynamic of this master and this slave. And as I was explaining stories uh, about what I'd gone through growing up, it, it was just, he shook his head and I said, don't lose that because that's what we need in the movie. I was under the impression when you granted me an audience, it would be to discuss business. Oh, we weren't talking business yet. You were discussing my curiosity. When Leonardo walked in and he was like, y'all just think I'm the good looking dude to have all the models? Watch what's about to happen. And they said action. And we saw this dude elevate his game to a place to where you couldn't sleep at night. If you're doing a scene with him, you gotta wake up. Now, bright boy, I will admit you are pretty clever. But if I took this hammer here and I bashed in your skull with it, you would have the same three dimples in the same place as old Ben. As wonderful a leading man as Leo is, and you know, leading men don't grow on trees. It's kind of a big deal to be a good leading man. 
He's also a, a terrific character actor. I don't think he ever thinks in terms of, I'm playing the good guy, I'm playing the bad guy. He couldn't help but realize that the guy was a repellent gargoyle. All right, true that. But at the same time, I wanted him to let us get a sense of who Calvin Candy is. How could this way of life actually exist in this time period? Yo, Candy, I ain't got it in me no more. No, 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 begging. I'm playing on my soft heart. In trouble now, son. <laughs> and to watch Leo knee jerk, that's what I hope people understand. When he had to say some of that language, he was like, buddy, this is wow. And um, Samuel Jackson said, hey, man, it's just another Tuesday. Get over that, man. It is what it is, man. Now, shit, now. Come on, now. And uh, to see Leo come in the next day and not speak to us. His work is very courageous, you know, because he's not that guy. <laughs> Gonna have to excuse Mr. Stone Cypher's slack jawed gaze. He ain't never seen a nigga like you ever in his life. Ain't that right, Mr. Stone Cypher? It's difficult to watch. And I think when you're dealing with these themes and this time, feeling like it's difficult to watch your fellow actors probably means that people are, are hooked into the emotional truth of the moment. Seeing as you won't pay a penny for this picking any here. You won't mind me handling this nigga any way I see fit. His characterization is you know, kind of awesome. And he's brought something to the character that I didn't see on the page. Got him up to the left here now, boy. And that's made everybody else kind of step up to another place also. Uh, Sam's an amazing actor such a powerful force when it comes on set. I mean, you read your dialogue and you think about the scene in a very specific way, and then this tornado just comes in that is Sam Jackson, and you need to step up to the plate and, <laughs> and, 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 and try to bring yourself up to that energy. Hello, Steven, my boy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hello, my ass. Who this nigga up on that name? You could tell it's his world. He was like a dog laying down his territory. You know what I'm saying? Who the hell is this on his neck? And the shaking, I was like, oh. What's the matter? Why are you so honored? You miss me? Huh? Oh, yes, sir. I miss you. Like a like a hog miss flop. Like a like a, a baby. Miss Mammy Titty. <laughs> I miss you like I misses a rock in my shoe. <laughs> I mean, even in rehearsal, Jamie and I were like, whoa, what what is he doing? They're spinning not. Go up in the guest bedroom to get too ready. And to watch Quentin and Sam's relationship makes you jealous. Like, wow, man, them dudes know each other. They got each other's back. They figured things out. It was coming up with nifty stuff that wasn't even in the script, but just enhanced everything. This liar ain't got no draws on. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's check the game. Sam had heard I was writing the script. And so I gave him a call. And I go, uh, so, what do you think about uh, the character of Steven? What do you mean, what do I think about him? You know, I would go, uh, well, I mean, do you have any problem playing that character? So what do you ask me? Do I have any problem playing the most despicable black MF in the history of cinema? I go, yeah. No, I got no problem with that. <laughs> it's always great to find a, a character on the inside of one of Quentin's stories to kind of wrap myself around. We came up with the age look, and we did about seven, eight makeup tests until we got to this particular place here. And it's turned out rather well. Doctor. Doc, you can't go in there. Uh, Stevens. Steve. You ain't got no business going in there. The very first day that I got here, he came up to say hello. And I didn't know who it was. I just said, oh, wow, really, really nice to meet you. And he's like, looking at me like, motherfucker, I just said. And I just said, Sam Jackson? Oh, my God. Oh, Monsieur Condé, you can't imagine what it's like not to hear your native tongue in four years. Well, hell, I can't imagine two weeks in Boston. <laughs> <laughs> Two weeks in Baltimore. <laughs> Calvin and I, we have an interesting relationship. I was here since his father was here. Probably spent a lot of time with him as a child and kind of raised him. There is kind of an interesting parallel between both Django and Schultz and Stephen and Candy, where Stephen and Schultz are the mentors and in some ways mirror opposites of each other. The ironic part about it is, as much as Django and Schultz like each other, Stephen loves Candy more. 
And ultimately, Calvin loves Stephen more. You know, Stephen is kind of his father. They playing your ass for a fool. They ain't here for no muscle-bound Jimmy. Well, thank you, Stephen. You're welcome, Calvin. Stephen is a self-serving, conniving, rotten guy. He's just the same as Calvin Candy. He just happens to be wearing a black skin. Now, if you have a man like Samuel L. Jackson playing that part, who's a socially conscious man, it's not just some silly caricature. You know, there's an importance and a dignity to that part because it's telling something about history. Well, I've kind of discovered where I wanted to go with him, who he was, and what I wanted him to be. And hopefully I'll be the most hated Negro in cinematic history if I do my job right. You said you ain't know him. I don't. Yes, you do. I'm always glad to be in a creative space with Carrie. Yes, Stephen. I don't. She has this very um, soft and gentle and sort of beautiful nature that's kind of filled with fragility that's uh, covering this strong thing that she has inside her. Why is you lying to me? Lying. Then why is you crying? Why is I'm scaring you? Because you're scared. Her acting is just amazing, just with her eyes, just what she was embodying in the character. She was the one who we all cared about the most. We wanted to make sure she was good because she had to go through hell. And to watch her go through hell every day, it was, it was tough. And we talked back and forth on the phone, and it was great seeing her because, you know, with Ray Charles, you know, that was, eh, eh, you know what, uh, that, eh, that was my girl. <laughs> I mean, we're all in love with her. She's funny, she's smart, she's gorgeous, she's super cool. She's your partner in crime. Go ahead, girl, speak a little German. I remember sitting in rehearsal one day and I was like going through my script and I looked up at the table and it was, you know, Kristoff and Jamie and Sam Jackson and Leonardo DiCaprio and Quentin and me. And I was like, how did this happen? This is nuts. <laughs> the universe sort of has protected this movie in a lot of ways with magical casting. Walt Goggins, Dennis Christopher, Jonah Hill. James Remar, and of course, Don Johnson. Big Daddy is basically your everyday run-of-the-mill pimp in the 1850s. <laughs> what if I was to say I don't like you, and I wouldn't sell you a tinker's damn? Now, what you got to say about that? He's every ridiculous cliche of the plantation owner who is extraordinarily arrogant. Mr. Bennett, if you are the businessman I've been led to believe you to be, I have 5,000 things I might say that could change your mind. And Quentin takes these classic stereotypes and just goes, you know what? Not only can these guys be beaten, but fundamentally they're ridiculous. Well, come on inside and get yourself something cool to drink. Oh, man, come on. My sister still quotes his lines. Uh, uh Bettina. Yes, every day. Bettina Sugar, could you take a, uh, uh, what, what, what's your Jimmy's name again? Uh, what's your Jimmy's name again? Django. Django. Uh, uh, Jack, uh, Jack, Jack, uh, uh, take Django here. Could you take Django there and take him around the ground here and show him all the pretty stuff? <laughs> all right, uh, if you could keep your caterwauling down to a minimum, I'd like to finish my line of inquiry with young Django. Genius! <laughs> we had all these extraordinary actors, and it was like watching this amazing all-star game. Guys, guys, get in your spot. We're trying to line up. And here's Quentin, our fearless leader, moving them all through, just thrilled with what he's getting out of everybody. He still likes to use film, which is great. I think I like that better. He's still using one camera. No cell phones on the set, no electronics on the set. He's there for every shot. He's there with you on the set, in the trenches, 100% of the time. If you ever get an opportunity to do a Quentin Tarantino movie, your biggest problem will be wanting to say all of the words at once, because they're so goddamn good. You better listen to your boss, white boy. Oh, I'm gonna go walking in the moonlight with you. You wanna hold my hand? It's like eating the greatest meal and not wanting to let a bite fall from your mouth. Hold it, hold it, hold it. You know, Quentin always does something that makes people think and have conversation about what they've seen or about whether it's real or unreal. I want you to burn a runaway eye right here in his cheek. And a girl, too. 
like Inglorious Bastards, Quentin was recreating history in a lot of ways, but none of this wasn't historically accurate. And everything in this movie, things like this did happen, but we get to see it through Quentin Tarantino's eyes. I understand when people read this script, like when I read the script, when my sister read the script, it, it pokes holes in you, pokes holes in your soul, because you can't believe that, wow, it was really like that back then. The ghosts are still here, and it is a part of our history that Quentin won't let us run away from. He's kind of turning the revisionist around and heading right back into the fire to say, no, 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 there's another part of this story, and this is the other part of that story. Let's don't mince words about it. Let's go over the top to land in a place that's authentic. He is not afraid of violence and darkness and sort of the dark side of the soul. Okay, and action. And yet, because it is fundamentally a love story, you also need someone who fundamentally believes in the goodness of human beings and hold on to the love story in the space of all that evil and darkness. He's a troublemaker. I think it's amazing that he's able to hold both of those spaces. I commend him for, for, for making a movie like this because I don't think there's many people that could. Keep moving. I could only hope that it would encourage you know more filmmakers in Hollywood to make more films about this subject matter because it's something that needs to be talked about still, you know, in, in any genre. Well, no, 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 here's the thing. You can like, oh, 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 one minute, Bennett. Quentin takes these genre elements and shifts them and in my perception, raises them onto a different level. Yes, he, he does uh, utilize the genre, but that's not really what it is about. Three, two, one, action. Where you think something is gonna be a traditional spaghetti western, he'll mix it up, he'll change something, whether it's the wardrobe or the location or the actor. Time for surrender. I love the Eastwood movies and Sergio Corbucci and Sergio Leone. Very much like Quentin, they defined their era and their style with that uh, big, broad scope and then these, you know, extreme close-ups and stuff like that. I guess you're right. We throw the focus on the horse. And it's what really I interesting that Quentin, being the product of the culture that made Western possible at all, where the, you know, because the, it's the American West, of course, that Quentin would take the genre once removed into the Italian and bring it back to America. He takes like a double turn. If anyone tried to duplicate what he does, I think they would be sued for copyright infringement because he's got his own unique, specific style. And when you see a Quentin Tarantino movie, you, you know it. I don't know a, a person alive who wasn't didn't grow up as a kid wanting to, you know, play cowboys and ride horses and have a gun strapped to your side. Uh, you know, it's like grown-up Disneyland. Good! That last one was the one! But we're gonna go for one more!